before we begin the questions, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I used to, I was married to my husband who was in the army. And he was in the, Royal, uh, the Queen's Royal Regiment and he went to Normandy and on D-Day and then he was captured at Falaise and about 10 days later and in he was a prisoner of war Brunswick near Hanover in southern Germany and when he came home it was, <laughs> it was wonderful to know that the off lag 79 was I saw it in the I think it was the front of the Times or the Observer. The Offleg 79 had been relieved by three Americans in the Jeep. So I knew that he was coming home. And he arrived home and we then got married and my name was changed from Havilon to Stimson. And we were married in Peterborough. And we, we, he was a teacher in Peterborough then we went to school, residential schools, one at Tixover in Rutland, and then in uh, Oldwall in Yorkshire. And there were schools, residential schools for boys. One, well, the first one, Tixover, was for uh, boys that were in care or had been through the courts. And the second one in Tixover was for educational subnormal, which you don't use that word now, but the IQ, the normal IQ is 100, right? But the lowest was 32, and the highest, our intelligent boy, was number 80. So it was quite a range. And he went there as a deputy head, and I was deputy matron as the boys. And they were age range from 7 to 16. And then we came, he had um, a course at Cambridge, and I came down with him. And then um, he was then in charge, in, eventually, in Birmingham. And the um, junior training centres, you heard of those? They are, oh, well, they, at that time, there were only seven in Birmingham. And he opened the eighth at Acots Green. And we have been, I've been in, he died soon afterwards, and I've been in Birmingham ever since. What were you doing at the start of the war? At the beginning of the war, I was in the Ministry of Pensions in London, actually, but they decided that it was best to move civil servants out of London. So we were given a label, a green label, mine was, blank, and take one piece of luggage and met at a certain station in London at a certain time. So I ended up in Blackpool. It was quite a surprise. And there I did the pensions for the people that have died. Then the main thing was that the Hood and the Courageous, the big ships, went down with hundreds and hundreds of sailors. And then I was doing their pensions for widows and orphans for that. The memo came round one day and said that public demand and opinion decided that young civil servants shouldn't be in the civil service, they should be helping the war and the forces. But they didn't realise, of course, we were helping in the way. But anyway, I volunteered to for 10 or 6 months a week, I would look my best in khaki. So I was conscripted into the arm. So that was uh, one thing. We went to Lancaster Barracks for initial training. That is, you're getting all your um, marching, you know, orders, everything, knowing how to, getting discipline in a way, and also getting your outfits. Well, the outfits never fitted, of course, at first, but eventually they got them right. And then I was sent to Oswestry for uh, training for about, oh, I think, two or three months, maybe four, four months, on radar. Um, you do a lot of um, tests, uh, intelligence tests, IQ and whatnot, and they decided that I was best to go on radar. 
So I learned how to work all the equipment for the Royal Artillery. Um, and uh, then when you completed all your training, you learned all the jobs, all the jobs that you had to learn on the transmitter and receiver, and also how to work, how to clean and keep, keep the generator in, in working order. And then um, I was sent to Manchester. And then that was a big, very big, uh, heavy ACAT battery. Heavy ACAT means heavy guns. They were very, very big guns, mainly perhaps three or four to a site. And uh, then we were sent after Manchester and all the raids. We had lots and lots of raids in Manchester, very, very heavy raids. Um, some nights we could, well, I should think, 800 shells a night, which is quite a lot, a lot. Um, you know, firing to try and get the aircraft down to stop them bombing. But you don't think of the man inside the aircraft. They're dropping bombs on you. So it's retaliation, really, and your discipline. You have to do that job. Um, and we even, at one time, were able to see Liverpool on fire. It was so massive. You see everywhere on fire. And one of the funny things at Manchester was that we were all in wooden huts um, next, next to a railway. And the railway, the trains were steam trains in those days. And <laughs> unfortunately, we were by um, a tunnel. And when the steam train came out the tunnel, all the sparks sent the grass on fire. Well, we didn't have any equipment. You just got a broom, anything, and you all rushed to stop the fire spreading. Hopefully, it was between roads. <laughs> so, and anyway, all the officers also, um, they, they, they joined in. And one day, the senior officer lost her eyebrows. <laughs> was a fire, it was a gorge. But it was, um, you know, you got wooden huts, and they, you were saving your sight as well. You had to do that. You all, but you, when you were on duty, you were on watch 24 hours a day, every day. And we, we had a team of, what, uh, well, about 22 girls. And you had to be, oh, this is the receiver and transmitter that we were sending signals out to calculate the height and the range of the aircraft so that when the guns fired, they could meet. Right. So that's what we, what we had to do. I was a sergeant then, and so I was in charge of the, of the girls. And you had to have, um, say, a 24-hour watch, but 23 hours only really, because you had to do a one year, one uh, hour of maintenance, so that all your equipment on the site were all pointing in the same direction, because it's 360 degrees that we were watching. It's like a, a round TV screen, and you had a, a time base going across, right, where your signals from the transmitter were going up to the aircraft or it could be even a steeple, a local, or a hill. And you had all these little bits coming. Well, 360 degrees, you knew, um, you knew the locality of all these little bits on. But if you saw a little bit moving, you got onto it. Because you had a column inside your equipment which had two handles like this, which turned the equipment round 36 degrees. And so did the transmitter, which transitioned the signal. So that you were following all the time, you were following the aircraft, right? And then your, you, your, all the time you were giving information down to the predictor, the predictor um, decided, predicted, how you were going to fire the gun, fire the shell, so that the aeroplane met the shell. 
So there was a time lapse. Do you get, do you get me? Yeah. yeah, there was a time lapse. So the predictor then gave the information, all, all of our cables, to the command post. And then the command post where all the officers and girls were there plotting and everything else. <coughs> and they told the guns when to fire. And they shouted fire. Well, in the end, it was so sophisticated, the equipment, that we had special core cables that went under the ground. And I was able to tell them when to fire on target fire. So it was much, much quicker in the end. Do you know whether you shot down any planes? I'm sorry, I don't know. We, we weren't always told. The only thing we, I was told is that the identification of friend or foe as I was the sergeant in charge, I had a special, we called them oscilloscopes, but they were like a little um, TV screen, round one. And I was able to give um, the height and the range of a plane if it was uh, in trouble, and they called Mayday signal. Now this signal was in every plane of the Allied and English planes. And uh, it would be unfortunate if one of the Germans had shot down some part of the equipment and we could fire on our own, which I have seen, which it was awful, but it was one of those things. But um, it also gave, um, you could have a mayday call. Now mayday meant that they were in trouble and it was a special signal on that oscilloscope, right? Well, you give the height and range to command post and they passed it on to general headquarters, right? Well, then one day I got a Mayday call because you're on watch all night as well and it happened to be in the middle of the night and they kept coming back to me and saying, are you sure about this? And I was dead sure that I'd found that Mayday call and a few days later I got a thank you from headquarters to say, that they had saved a pilot. So it was ra rather good. I was able to do that. That's funny. What was the most frightening thing that happened to you? I think the most frightening thing was when we were in Manchester and we had a lot of the gunners who operated these big heavy guns. They were on sick leave or something happened. They were very, very short of, of personnel. So they asked anybody, that, any ATS that was off duty, if they would come and help and go to the magazines. Well, the magazines are where they store the big shells. And the shells are in dual. There are two shells in a big iron um, or steel case, quite big, long one like that. And so, well, we volunteered. <laughs> we only had just tin hats on, <coughs> no earplugs, nothing. And anyway, it took three of us to go down this winding little stairway into the magazine to pick up these great big steel containers. And the guns were firing all the time on top of you and the noise was absolutely appalling. And we, we did, we managed to bring up these, the, uh, the, these bullets, you know, not bullets, to, to, for these great big things for the, for the guns. But it was, um, it was awful because, you know, the guns were firing, the bombs were falling, and, um, you know, and you've got a lethal weapon in your hands. So, but we helped, so that was the main thing, but it was rather frightening at the time. What did ATS stand for? ATS stands for Auxiliary Territorial Service. This is not not known now. It's the Women's Royal Army Corps. And that is disbanded now. And now the women join their regiments direct. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you now and how old were you when you became a member of the ATS? When I joined the Artillery Territorial Service, I was 21. And now I'm 88 and a half. What happened at the end of the war? 19, it was 1945, right, and um, we were sort of disbanded. We were on the uh, uh, West Kings Thames Estuary, 
where the V1s and the V2s came over, the buzz bombs, right? The buzz bombs, the V1s, were hor horrific. They were meant to be psychological, to frighten all the, all, the, uh, all the people, the population. That was the German object. The, the, the bus bombs were uh, like fire at the end of a big bomb. Well, when the engine stopped, it was terrific noise when it went over. When it stopped, there was 10 seconds before it dropped. Well, I was in a railway carriage. I can't remember where I was going on this train, but it was crowded. We all stopped. You know, we stopped talking. Everybody stopped and started counting because we heard this coming and it dropped on the station just we'd left. So that was the sort of thing that happened. The V2, we couldn't cope with that. It was going too fast and it fell in the Thames near us. Well, the powers that de be decided, well, um, we don't really need heavy ACAC anymore. The war is nearly over. So they disbanded us all. They sent us here, there and everywhere. And I landed up in Edinburgh and into an office. It was uh, quite, quite a change. And also we found that we were living in lovely houses. We had super food on the, f on the table. Couldn't believe it. You could buy cakes in the shops. And we didn't have uh, cinders under our feet in the mess. We had floorboards and we could sleep quite, quite nicely without worrying about getting, having to get up. So um, I was there. And I was, part of my duties in Edinburgh was to go to Edinburgh Castle. Now Edinburgh Castle then was closed to the public, obviously. But I was allowed because our stores were in the dungeons. So I used to go into the dungeons by jeep. I had a driver that drove me into the, to uh, Edinburgh Castle. And I quite enjoyed being in Edinburgh for a little while because I'd never been north of the border before. And then I was sitting on my bed, which I shouldn't have been, and uh, I was reading the Times or the Observer, I can't remember. And on the front was off leg 79, was relieved. And that was where my husband, well, husband-to-be was. And then he, when he came home, we got married. And we, you had special leave. If you had a prisoner of war coming home, we were allowed special leave from the army, so I got that. And then we were married. Now, in those days, no married women were allowed in the army. Sounds ridiculous, really. We'd done all the work before, but we weren't allowed to stay in the army. So I left. Thank you for answering my questions. It's a pleasure. I hope you enjoy it.